Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. Previously on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, we're talking about the warning or illumination of conscience. Especially for unapproved, unvetted seers, does a given seer read other seers' literature? That may be a sign the message is just being recycled with variations. And we should look at the variations. Is the current seer making more dramatic claims than previous seers? Is the current seer trying to claim more authority than other seers, such as because they have a more special role in God's plan. More dramatic claims and claims to more authority were problematic signs among contactees, and they are among seers too. Also, how credible is what the seer says overall, even about material that's not supposed to be revealed? Just like a contactee who makes bizarre and grandiose claims about their ordinary life, should be viewed with with suspicion, so should a person claiming to be in touch with heaven if they just make bizarre and grandiose claims about their ordinary life apart from what they're receiving in Revelation. There is the Canadian priest, Father Michel Rodrigue, but his messages are so dramatic we won't be able to evaluate them in this episode. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next episode, we're going to look at the reported revelations of Father Michel Rodrigue, who claims that Mary has designated him the Apostle of the Last Time. You're listening to episode 123 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Father Michel Rodrigue, the so-called Apostle of the Last Times. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In the last several years, Father Michel Rodrigue of Canada has been reporting revelations from God the Father, from Jesus Christ, and from a variety of saints and angels. They've told him about a series of apocalyptic events, including a third world war, that are about to start. They've even indicated that the events will start this month, in October 2020. His videos have gotten more than a million views on YouTube. Numerous people have been extremely frightened by what he's claimed. Who is Father Rodrigue? What does he predict? Are his revelations really from God? And how likely is his scenario to happen? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, that's the question. Who is Father Rodrigue, and how did he come to public attention? He's a French-Canadian priest incarnated in the Diocese of Hearst, Moussonet. That's in Ontario. He worked in that diocese from 1989 to 1996, at which point he moved to Montreal to join the Sulpicians. Since 2011, he has been living in the Diocese of Amos, Quebec. There, he founded the Apostolic Fraternity of St. Benedict Joseph Labre. Between 2011 and 2016, he also was pastor of two parishes in the diocese. In 2015, Father Rodrigue and a man named Simon Dufour founded a school called the Studium St. Joseph, I won't attempt the French-Canadian pronunciation, (laughs) which has Father Rodrigue as its rector. In 2016, he asked to be relieved of his two parishes, and the bishop agreed, assigning him three smaller parishes instead. Starting in 2017, Father Rodrigue began giving retreats in the United States, and in 2019, these became more frequent. In November of 2019, he gave a series of lectures in California, which were later posted on YouTube and embedded on the website countdowntothekingdom.com as part of a virtual retreat with Father Rodrigue. 
These videos reportedly went live on March 25th, 2020, and they've become very popular, with one of them having around a million views at the time of recording. As the videos became popular, I started getting inquiries from people alarmed by what Father Rodrigue was saying, and I decided to start doing research to see what service I might be able to be to these people. And what does Father Rodrigue claim? He has said, Over the last five years, God the Father has revealed many things to me about the near future, all of which I have shared with my bishop. Some of these are events that have already occurred. Others are yet to come. The times are urgent. One of the future events that the Father showed me represents, for me, a Pentecost. Others call it the warning. Suddenly the stars, the sun, and the moon will not shine. All will be black. In the heavens a sign of Jesus will appear and light up the sky and the world. He will be on the cross, not in his suffering, but in his glory. Behind him, in a pale light, will appear the face of the Father, the true God. It will be something, I assure you. From the wounds in Jesus' hands, feet, and side, bright shining rays of love and mercy will fall upon the entire earth, and everything will stop. If you are in an airplane, it will stop. If you are riding in a car, don't worry, the car will stop. If you ask me, how can that be? I will say, God is God. He is the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you think he cannot stop matter? Do you believe that your small airplane will outrun him? No. Everything will be fixed in time, and the flame of the Holy Spirit will enlighten every conscience on earth. The rays from Jesus' wounds will pierce every heart like tongues of fire, and we will see ourselves as if in a mirror before us. We will see our souls, how precious they are to the Father, and we will see the evil within ourselves. The illumination will last about 15 minutes, and in his merciful prejudgment, all will see immediately where they would go if they were to die right then, heaven, purgatory, or hell. It will be one of the greatest signs given to the world since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Father told me that the 21st century is his century. After the warning, no one left on earth will be able to say that God does not exist. As you would expect, a worldwide experience like this, which is the illumination of consciences we talked about in the last episode, would produce a lot of conversions. So Father Rodrigue says, After the illumination of conscience, another unparalleled gift will be granted to humanity, a period of repentance lasting about six and a half weeks when the devil will not have the power to act. This means that everyone will have their complete free will to make a decision for or against the Lord. The devil will not bind a person's will and fight against him or her. The Lord will calm everyone's passions and appease their desires. He will heal everyone from the distortion of their senses. So after this Pentecost, all will feel that their entire bodies are in harmony with him. The first two and a half weeks in particular will be extremely important because the devil will not return at that time, but people's habits will, and they will then be harder to convert. All who have received the desire for the Lord, the sense that they need his salvation, will be marked on their forehead with a luminous cross, invisible to the human eye, by their guardian angel. People will have to make a decisive choice, and you will understand why, because after that they will be left with the consequences of their decision. The time of mercy will end, and the time of justice will begin. Jesus said this to St. Faustina Kowalska. There will be so many people coming back to the church or coming into it for the first time that ordinary lay people will need to help. First and foremost, people will need to be reconciled to God, so you will bring them to a priest for confession. I assure you, the priests who are not in a state of grace will have a hard time because there will be long lines for confession. I saw the lines. They will need protection and help. Please prepare the priest some sandwiches. I assure you, if people don't halt the line, we will not be able to go to the bathroom. If people are not baptized, you will bring them for baptismal preparation, which will happen quickly because time will be short. We will baptize en masse as the apostles did. But this time will come to an end. When the devil returns after about six and a half weeks, he will disseminate a message to the world through the media, cell phones, TVs, etc. The message is this. A collective illusion happened on this date. Our scientists have analyzed this and found that it occurred at the same time a solar flare from the sun was released into the universe. It was so powerful that it affected the minds of the people on Earth, giving everyone a collective illusion. 
Then a persecution will break out, and to protect his people, God will guide them to special locations that are hidden from the devil. These places are known as refuges, and the refuges are a major theme in Father Rodriguez's messages. For some time, he's been encouraging people to consecrate their homes and land as refuges for the period after the warning. Here's part of his discussion of them. The time is now at your door, and only your guardian angel will guide you on the path of the refuge. You know, when I said the, the warning, after the warning, when the time to enter the, in the refuge will come, it's like a Pentecost. Huh? This Pentecost will continue until this time. A little flame will come in front of you, the tongue of the Holy Spirit. But this flame will move. It is your guardian angel who carry this flame for you. So you will follow your guardian angel. And when you will arrive at the refuse, surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. Open a new eyes and see. <laughs> you will see a guardian angel there. The one for the refuse. And then you will see your guardian angel. Yes. And you will enter in the refuse because he has guided you and he has marked you with a sign of the cross on your forehead. A battle here on earth and in the sky will soon open in this trouble period. At the end of the bad time, at the end, the triumph of my daughter Mary will be as she promised you. You will be able to see all the angels. It's me, the one who are good and the one who are bad. So, and now you will understand what it means, the refuge of the sacred heart. So in the refuge, you will be protected. The refuge, uh, I can describe that, you know, like a dome where you are. You will in, be inside of this. You will see outside of, your, of the refuge. But, you know, you have to be preoccupied by what happened inside. Not look outside. I as Lot, you know, the, the wife of Lot looked. So, and then she turned. <laughs> <laughs> so don't look or go outside of the refuge or a fate may befall you like Lot's wife. Also, there will be the introduction of a one world government and there will be a third world war. The one world order is preparing military core groups in different countries who will be disciples of Satan linked directly to them. When the devil's power returns after the warning, they will emerge as the one world government. Even now, their military police force is in place awaiting orders. You have to know that. Satan will start a nuclear war that will be global, the Third World War, his war against all of humanity. The devil will kill one-third of humanity in this war and through plagues and abortion, just as one-third of the angels were cast out of heaven into hell. Seven nuclear missiles will be permitted to strike the United States as a result of its abominations. Many nuclear missiles will be deflected by the hand of God because America prays the Divine Mercy Chaplet. I was told this by the Eternal Father. A false prophet, the Antichrist, will try to dominate the world through the one world government. He will require you to have a mark, a chip, in order to buy and sell, and those who do not take the mark will be hunted like the SS hunted the Jews during World War II. Many Christians will be forced to confess their faith in front of others and die as martyrs. Many others will be protected in refuges. I know that the war will come from two countries. One is Korea and the other is Iran. They will come together to face the United States of America. As part of the persecution, both Pope Francis and former Pope Benedict will be martyred. The Antichrist is in the hierarchy of the church right now, and he has always wanted to sit in the chair of Peter. Pope Francis will be like Peter the Apostle. He will realize his errors and try to gather the church back under the authority of Christ, but he will not be able to do so. He will be martyred. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, who still wears his papal ring, 
will step in to convene a council attempting to save the church. I saw him, weak and frail, held up on either side by two Swiss guards, fleeing Rome with devastation all around. He went into hiding, but then was found. I saw his martyrdom. So Pope Francis will be martyred, and Pope Emeritus Benedict will call a council to try to save the church, but he too will be martyred. On another occasion, Father Rodrigue said this, Something will happen in Rome, and I know it will be the sacrificial of the Pope. And because of this, the people think that the church is dead. No way. He has protected his church. This is why he has this refuge everywhere, that the faithful remnant will go and enter it. He will protect and save his people. And during the time of the refuge time, we will have no Pope during three years and a half, because the Antichrist will sit on the seat of Rome. But don't worry, when the time will be, a new Pope will be elected. So people will have to stay in the refuges for three and a half years. During this time, Antichrist will sit on the seat of Rome, but afterwards a new Pope will be elected. While they're waiting in the refuges, people will still have access to the Eucharist. A priest will also be available for every refuge, and when the priest isn't there, the angel will bring the holy host to the people for communion. But they will need to get rid of all electronics. You will not bring a cell phone. You will leave the car far from you and your property. You will not use the internet and will throw out your computer, your television, any kind of electronic device, because the devil has already worked on these products before you obtained them. He has implemented inside of them the means to find you wherever you are. But people will still get news of what's happening in other refuges because God will miraculously move designated messengers from one to another. All of the refuges will be connected together. People in each refuge will be chosen as messengers. They will be declared in each refuge with this gift. They will be taken by the Holy Spirit to go and help, connecting with other refuges so that people will know what is happening everywhere. If you are in need, the messengers will know what to do. They will be like Philip in the Acts of the Apostles. You remember in the Bible when Philip, the apostle, went to the eunuch and baptized him, and immediately afterward, the Holy Spirit took Philip away and put him in another place. It will be exactly the same. And Jesus will miraculously multiply the food you have in your refuge, so you won't need to have a three and a half year supply on hand for everyone. There's a lot more to Father Rodrigue's messages, but this will do for our purposes. And when does Father Rodrigue think all of these things will start to happen? Very soon, which is one of the things that has been causing people to experience panic. According to him, the Archangel Gabriel told him, And he said, this is representing the bishop in province of Quebec. He said, when the last bishop will be replaced, it will be time for the hour of Christ. I said, wow. But for your information, just one bishop still have not been replaced yet. But he will finish his term, I think, this fall, something like that. I have, I have to look for the birthday. So with the final bishop in Quebec about to be replaced by a successor, that would indicate a very near time frame, as do other things Father Michel has said. St. Michael has told him, now, with the message that I received this year by St. Michael, he said to me that it's, it, the, purification, the purification is now. And in November of 2019, Father Rodrigue said, And he said, one must be in state of grace to receive salvation. Make sure this year, this year, not next one, to make a general confession by taking up the commandments of the Lord as the light of your lives and confessing all the sins committed. So he indicated that it was urgent to make a general confession this year, meaning 2019, not next one. At the same event in 2019, he also said... And I can recall, you know, when I was in front of the manger, uh, you know, this little manger, and I can pray with that. You know, I can, in my heart, was singing in front of the, 
the manger of the Lord. And I hope you will do it for Christmas. Do it for Christmas, especially this one. Because uh, the next one, you know. So do it for this one. And make a manger at home. So the apocalyptic events should begin happening by the following Christmas, meaning Christmas 2020. And by apocalyptic events, I don't mean events at the very end of the world, but events that are part of the overall prophetic plan that Father Rodriguez is announcing. On March 24th, 2020, he sent a letter to his supporters in which he said, After this period of compulsory confinement, that is, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, life will resume its course. The summer period will open a window of time where we will be able to prepare well for the coming test, that of being with Jesus on the cross. So, the summer of 2020 was supposed to be a time to prepare for the coming trial. On March 26, 2020, he sent another letter to his followers in which he wrote, My dear people of God, we are now passing a test. The great events of purification will begin this fall. Be ready with the rosary to disarm Satan and to protect our people. Make sure that you are in the state of grace by having made your general confession to a Catholic priest. The spiritual battle will begin. Remember these words. The month of the rosary will see great things. So he says the great events of the purification will begin this fall and the month of the rosary, that is October, will see great things. We would thus expect the apocalyptic events he predicts to begin this month, which we're already halfway through, so this is a very timely episode. And how can we evaluate whether Father Rodrigue's messages are authentic private revelations or not? In the absence of a formal judgment issued by the proper church authorities, we can do an investigation of our own into the matter. We should use the same criteria that the church uses, which are found in a 1978 document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. It lists two sets of criteria, positive ones and negative ones, that bishops should use in evaluating apparitions. We're going to look at these criteria, but first I should note that there's a clear flaw in the standard English translation of this document. The English translation keeps referring to the fact in a way that we don't in English. For example, it says that the local ordinary should judge the fact according to positive and negative criteria. But what fact is that? In English, we would either say that the local ordinary, meaning the bishop, should judge the facts, plural, or we'd translate this some other way. In Italian, the word translated fact is fatto. And fatto can be translated multiple ways. If you check a standard Italian dictionary, one of the common meanings that you'll see for this word is event. The same is true of the Latin word factum, which is used in the Latin version of the document. And that makes a lot more sense. The bishop should judge the event according to positive and negative criteria. We'll have a link to a standard dictionary where you can see this uh, meaning for yourself. With that in mind, here are the positive criteria that the bishop should apply to judge whether an apparition is genuine. A. Positive criteria. A. Moral certitude, or at least great probability of the existence of the event, acquired by means of a serious investigation. B. Particular circumstances relative to the existence and to the nature of the event, that is to say, one, personal qualities of the subject or of the subjects, in particular psychological equilibrium, honesty, and rectitude of moral life, sincerity and habitual docility towards ecclesiastical authority, the capacity to return to a normal regimen of a life of faith, etc. 2. As regards revelation, true theological and spiritual doctrine and immune from error. 3 healthy devotion, and abundant and constant spiritual fruit, for example, spirit of prayer, conversion, testimonies of charity, etc. And there are negative criteria a bishop should apply. B. Negative criteria. A. Manifest error concerning the event. B. Doctrinal errors attributed to God himself or to the Blessed Virgin Mary or to some saint in their manifestations, taking into account, however, the possibility that the subject might have added, even unconsciously, 
purely human elements or some error of the natural order to an authentic supernatural revelation. C. Evidence of a search for profit or gain strictly connected to the event. D. Gravely immoral acts committed by the subject or his or her followers when the event occurred or in connection with it. E. Psychological disorder or psychopathic tendencies in the subject that with certainty influenced on the presumed natural event or psychosis, collective hysteria, or other things of this kind. You may notice that both the positive and the negative criteria mirror each other. Some, both positive and negative, deal with the event itself. Some deal with the spiritual fruit connected with the event, and some deal with the seer. When we do our analysis, we'll use the three categories and review the relevant positive and negative criteria under each one. Before we do that, what judgments do bishops traditionally make concerning an apparition? In terms of final bottom line judgments, there are traditionally three, which are often referred to by Latin phrases. The first is constat de supernaturalitate, which basically means established as supernatural. This is the judgment given to apparitions that receive final approval as being worthy of belief, though the faithful are not required to believe in them since they're only private revelations. One is not a bad Catholic if one has a different opinion. The second traditional judgment is non-constat de supernaturalitate, which basically means not established as supernatural. This judgment is given when the bishop has looked into the apparition and concluded that it cannot be established as being of supernatural origin, either because there isn't enough positive evidence to conclude that it is, or because there's significant negative evidence suggesting that it's not. The third traditional judgment is constat de non supernaturalitate, which basically means established as not supernatural. This judgment is given when a bishop determines that there is enough negative evidence to issue a definitive ruling that the apparition is not supernatural. And in this case, supernatural is a term of art that basically means of divine origin. To be judged not supernatural means it's not coming from God. It might be purely natural, like due to a person's imagination or even an outright hoax, or it might be of diabolical origin. Either way, it's not from God. Hasn't there been a controversy in recent years about whether the third category is still in use? Yes, some have argued that the third category, not supernatural, was folded into the second category, not established as supernatural. So there were now only two judgments, one positive and one negative. Until recently, I would have argued that myself, the reason being that only the first two judgments are explicitly mentioned in the 1978 guidelines. However, I'm always doing research, and recently I found a letter from Joseph Ratzinger in 2003, when he was the head of the CDF, which unambiguously indicated that the third category was still operative. We'll have a link to that letter so you can read it for yourself. In any event, it appears that all three of the traditional rulings can still be given. My current understanding is that the CDF prefers bishops to use rulings in one of the first two categories, which is why they get explicit mention in the document, but the third category can still be used when the case warrants it. Before we start applying the criteria, is there anything else we should be aware of? Yes. One of the things the CDF stresses is that there isn't a one-strike-and-you're-out rule. According to the guidelines, It is to be noted that these criteria, be they positive or negative, are not peremptory, but rather indicative, and they should be applied cumulatively or with some mutual convergence. So just because there may be a sign in favor or a sign against Father Rodrigue's messages, that doesn't determine the matter. A single positive sign doesn't show them to be of supernatural origin, and a single negative sign doesn't show that they're not. We need to look for overall patterns in the data to form an opinion. So don't jump the gun by forming an opinion based on just a single instance. Let's take a look at Father Michel's revelations. What were the criteria concerning the event itself? The positive criterion that the bishop was to apply was moral certitude, or at least great probability of the existence of the event acquired by means of a serious investigation. 
And the negative one corresponding to that was manifest error concerning the event. Unfortunately, these criteria are phrased so concisely that it's hard to know precisely what the CDF means, and I haven't been able to find a lot of commentary on the subject. Minimally, these words would mean that the bishop has credible reports that something happened that warrants his investigation. And further, if the reports he has contain manifest errors, that's a strike against the thing being genuinely supernatural. These criteria might mean more than that, but at this point, I can't show that they do, so we'll go with the minimal reading since they must mean at least that much. Understood that way, how do these criteria apply to Father Michel's case? There's definitely something going on that warrants investigation, and this is exceptionally well documented as we have many audio and video recordings of Father Rodrigue discussing his experiences, as well as transcripts and letters that he's written. And what about the criterion concerning spiritual fruit? According to the CDF guidelines, it's a positive sign when, in the judgment of the diocesan bishop, an apparition can be associated with healthy devotion and abundant and constant spiritual fruit, for example, spirit of prayer, conversion, testimonies of charity, etc., this criterion is often misunderstood and misapplied, particularly by those who favor an apparition. But notice carefully what it calls for the diocesan bishop to assess, whether there has been abundant and constant spiritual fruit. That means not only a lot of fruit, it also means that this needs to continue for an extended period of time. In the book, Mariology, a guide for priests, deacons, seminarians, and consecrated persons, Mariologist Mark Miravalle observes, The norm specifies fruits that endure, as even false apparitions could potentially cause temporary fruits based on an alleged call for prayer and conversion. And notice that it's the diocesan bishop who is the one to make this assessment, not a person who's a devotee of the apparition. We need an objective observer, not a person caught up in the fervor of an event. Even in the case of condemned apparitions like Bayside, you'd have devotees saying, hey, we've got a lot of spiritual fruit here. People are praying and converting and going to the sacraments. This apparition must be true, but it's not. Even proven hoaxes can bring individual people closer to God. So, despite how spiritual fruit is often cited by devotees of an apparition, that's not sufficient. For this criterion to be fulfilled, we need to see abundant and long-lasting spiritual fruit as judged from an objective perspective, not from the perspective of people caught up in an experience. So, how does this apply to Father Rodrigue's case? His supporters definitely claim that he's producing abundant spiritual fruit, but people say that about every apparition that gains a following. Also, critics of his messages have claimed that there is unhealthy spiritual fruit also being born. The matter is subjective, and because of the complexities of the issue, I won't pass judgment on it here. However, I will note that Father Rodrigue's revelations, and especially the period of their popularity, is far too short for this criterion to be fulfilled. He's only had his breakout popularity in the last one or two years, so not nearly enough time has passed to say that the condition of abundant and constant spiritual fruit has been met. So this criterion hasn't been met, and it would take years more time to meet it. What about the criteria dealing with the content of the message itself? The positive criterion was true theological and spiritual doctrine and immune from error. And its flip side was doctrinal errors attributed to God himself or to the Blessed Virgin Mary or to some saint in their manifestations, taking into account, however, the possibility that the subject might have added, even unconsciously, purely human elements or some error of the natural order to an authentic supernatural revelation. Father Michel definitely proposes ideas that are not taught by the Church. All of his discussions of the warning, the refuges, the three days of darkness, and things like that fall into this category. However, these don't contradict Church teaching. I mean, they're not taught by the Church, but they don't contradict it either, so they don't count as a strike against him. 
Some critics have faulted him on other matters, but I'm not persuaded by most of the arguments I've seen accusing him of doctrinal error. I will note that, depending on your perspective, he's made some questionable statements. For example, he seems to suggest that there will be dogs and other animals in heaven, which is contrary to the standard theological opinion that animals don't survive death since they don't have rational souls like we do. But that's a matter of opinion rather than church teaching, so I won't fault him for that. I will point out a few things, though. First, you'll recall that he said that after the assassination of Pope Francis, Pope Emeritus Benedict would attempt to call a council to save the church. This is very implausible because Canon 338, Section 1 of the Code of Canon Law states, It is for the Roman pontiff alone to convoke an ecumenical council, preside over it personally or through others, transfer, suspend, or dissolve a council, and to approve its decrees. As a Pope Emeritus, Benedict would have no authority to convoke an ecumenical council, so that's not likely to happen. Second, Father Rodrigue says that during the period of the refuges, the Antichrist will sit on the seat of Rome. That's problematic because the traditional theological understanding of the Antichrist is that he will not be a papal pretender, but a tyrannical political ruler on the model of the Roman Emperor Nero. According to Father Rodrigue, the Antichrist will have three manifestations, a false pope, a political leader, and a financial head. The idea of the Antichrist manifesting as a false pope, an antipope though, is problematic. This, though, could be a human element that Father Rodrigue's consciousness added to his messages, but it's still at odds with the traditional understanding and the biblical data. Third, you'll note that one of the things this criterion called for was true spiritual doctrine. And here we have something that is definitely problematic. According to Father Rodrigue, God demands that every family have a representation of the Holy Family in their homes that is blessed by a priest. He claimed that on October 13th, 2018, God the Father gave him a message in which he said, I demand that every family who receive this message should have a representation of the Holy Family in their home. And Father Rodrigue apparently received criticism over the word demand. But he doubles down on it. The word demand has trembled many. Because they said, how come the father demand? Uh -uh. <laughs> when he gave Moses the, the Ten Commandments, he doesn't say to Moses, how you feel it? <laughs> <laughs> we call that commandment. So, according to Father Rodrigue, God the Father demands or commands a specific form of pious devotion to the Holy Family, namely placing a representation of them in your home and having it blessed by a priest. That is inconsistent with true spiritual doctrine. God does not demand or command particular forms of pious devotion like this. He doesn't even demand that people pray the rosary, much less require people to have an image of the Holy Family in their house. God may encourage such things or even promise that if people do such things, they will receive certain blessings, but he doesn't make them requirements. This betrays a false understanding of the church's spiritual doctrine. It's a doctrinal error. And since he attributes this directly to God the Father, it falls afoul of the CDF's norm that says a negative sign would be doctrinal errors attributed to God himself. So that's a strike against his revelations being of supernatural origin. I want to take a moment right now to take a break from our discussion and thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Dell M, Victoria M., Rex K, Alan E, and Barbara T. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. 
I also want to say a special thanks to the mysterious irregulars. Sherlock Holmes had the Baker Street irregulars, and recently we set up the mysterious irregulars to help me when I have research tasks that I need some assistance with. Father Rodrigue's videos are so extensive, there's just hours and hours of them, that I enlisted a group of volunteers from among our patrons to help by watching the videos and noting time codes for moments that could be relevant to our investigation, so I could then review those in more detail. And they were a huge help. I really want to thank them. I also want to point out that all of the conclusions we're presenting today are mine. So I'm not speaking on behalf of the Irregulars. They form their own opinions about all this, but they were very helpful in identifying moments that I needed to look at, and so I really want to thank them for that. I also reached out to both Daniel O'Connor and Christine Watkins of the Countdown to the Kingdom website while doing research for this episode, and they were both very helpful. They may have different conclusions than I have, but I found them both to be very helpful and reasonable, and our exchanges were cordial and informative, so I want to publicly thank them. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. So, Jimmy, back to the topic. What were the criteria that were connected with the visionary himself? Here, the positive criterion was personal qualities of the subject or of the subjects, in particular, psychological equilibrium, honesty and rectitude of moral life, sincerity and habitual docility towards ecclesiastical authority, the capacity to return to a normal regimen of a life of faith, etc. And the negative ones were Evidence of a search for profit or gain strictly connected to the event, gravely immoral acts committed by the subject or his or her followers when the event occurred or in connection with it, psychological disorder or psychopathic tendencies in the subject that with certainty influenced on the presumed supernatural event or psychosis, collective hysteria, or other things of this kind. So let's start going through these. All right, how do you want to start? I want to begin by getting one of the weaker categories of evidence out of the way. How a person presents himself is one of the things that needs to be taken into account in assessing his credibility. I mean, when the police interview a person or when juries listen to a witness on the stand, one of the things they consider is how the person is presenting himself and whether he's acting appropriately given what's being discussed. This is a subjective matter, and people may come to very different conclusions, but it is one of the things that needs to be considered, even if it's one of the weaker forms of evidence. As part of researching this episode, when I asked the Mysterious Irregulars to watch and listen to Father Michelle's talks, one of the things they overwhelmingly commented on was his use of humor, including situations where it might not be appropriate. Now, People have different temperaments, and some are naturally more jovial than others. Father Rodrigue uses a lot of humor in his talks. In fact, he uses a lot more humor than many people would expect from a man delivering such dire warnings about the future. However, the question is whether Father Rodrigue's humor is or isn't appropriate given what he's discussing. We could play a a lot of examples, but we'll look at just two, and you can form your own opinion. Here's Father Rodrigue discussing a heavenly message he received in which he appears to joke about the words he received from God. The words he begins by reading are supposed to be the words of God the Father, but notice how he makes light of them. The gift of the illumination of conscience from the Holy Spirit of love and the unique grace of salvation of my son Jesus are enough (laughs) to calm you. (gasps) Let's hear that again. The gift of the illumination of conscience from the Holy Spirit of love and the unique grace of salvation of my son Jesus are enough 
<laughs> to calm you. <laughs> and here he tells a story about a baby that was born prematurely. Initially, he prayed to the baby Jesus that a woman's premature labor would stop, which it did. But when the baby was born, it had a heart defect. And his second prayer could be interpreted as humorously disrespectful to Jesus. <laughs> so I, I, I went back to the chapel. <laughs> and I said to her, you know, Jesus, <laughs> you remember this one? <laughs> I said, you remember him? He was so tiny. (laughs) But, uh, you know, something happened now. Apparently that when you pass. (laughs) Did you forget this part? (laughs) Once again. (laughs) So I I, I went back to the chapel. And I said to her, you know, Jesus, (laughs) you remember this one? (laughs) I said, you remember him? He was so tiny. (laughs) But, uh, you know, something happened now. Apparently that when you pass. (laughs) Did you forget this part? (laughs) Now, like I said, this is a subjective matter, so different people's mileage will vary. Some may think that this kind of humor regarding God and his son is not what one would expect from a holy visionary. Others may not see it as an issue. I leave it to you to form your own impression. One of the negative personal criteria the CDF gives is a search for profit connected with the apparition. What about that criterion? This has been recognized as a negative sign all the way through church history. In the very first century, the church manual known as the Didache, which seems to be as old as some of the books of the New Testament, gave a series of tests for recognizing true and false apostles and prophets. And among the things it said was this. Let every apostle who comes to you be welcomed as if he were the Lord. And when the apostle leaves, he is to take nothing except bread until he finds his next night's lodging. But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. If anyone should say in the spirit, give me money or anything else, do not listen to him. But if he tells you to give on behalf of others who are in need, let no one judge him. So giving a prophetic message that asks for money or anything else has always been recognized as a sign that the message is false. Has Father Michel done that? It appears so. The following is a message he presented as coming from God the Father. My dear sons and daughters, together I ask you to do everything you can to help my son, Michel, to build the monastery that will form the priests aware of the end times. Listen to my voice. Be ready. The priests who are prepared by the Monastery of St. Benedict Joseph Labre will be those who serve the survivors who will come out of my shelter. So here, God the Father is represented as asking people who receive the message to do everything you can to help my son Michel to build the monastery. If you were in the immediate vicinity of the monastery and could go there and swing a hammer, you might be able to provide a form of non-financial help. But the message doesn't appear to have been sent just to a local audience in the immediate vicinity of the monastery. The only way people at a distance could practically help would be to offer financial donations. Therefore, this message appears to be a direct request from God the Father for money, backed up by the implication that you need to donate to have priests to help the survivors after the three and a half years spent in the refuges. That apparent request for money attributed to God the Father is a strike against the supernatural origin of the message. Couldn't you say this isn't a request for money for Father Rodrigue himself? Yes, and there have been people throughout history claiming to receive heavenly messages asking for money for some worthy project. That's not a guarantee that the money would actually go to that project. I'm sure that In the first century, when the Didache was written, false prophets were smart enough not to just boldly say, give me money, 
but to cloak it in some apparently worthy venture. Are you saying Father Michel plans to misappropriate funds? No, I'm simply saying that, per the CDF's own norms, asking for money in words attributed directly to God the Father is a sign that the message may not be authentic. Among the criteria the CDF listed for the visionary were honesty and psychological equilibrium. What can we say here? This gets us into a delicate area because these are among the most personal criteria. If one comes back with anything other than a ringing endorsement, one can come across as impugning either a person's honesty or sanity. Nevertheless, some people lie, and some people have mental disturbances that make them prone to innocently making fantastic claims. So this kind of analysis must be done, however sensitive it may be. What counts is how credible a person's claims are, not whether they're due to deliberate deception or being innocently fantasy-prone. Regardless of the cause, if a person has a history of making claims that are difficult to believe, it's a sign that his revelations may not be authentic. What about situations where things that are hard to believe turn out to be true? Well, those cases definitely exist. People can have lives where amazing things happen. And if it can be documented that a person's life involves a series of amazing events, it's a sign he's telling the truth. But if a person makes a series of amazing claims and no documentation is available for them, it's a mark against his credibility. Have you been able to do a thorough investigation of all Father Rodrigue's claims to see whether documentation can be found? No, I haven't. The fact that he indicates apocalyptic events will start this very month has prevented me from digging into the public records to see whether or not they support his story. Because of the incredibly short window of time available, I can only make an assessment based on the text of Father Rodrigue's claims and whether they are intrinsically likely in the absence of documentation. Okay, let's look at this sensitive subject then. Does Father Rodrigue have a history of making claims that are difficult to believe? It's certainly the case that he makes a number of extraordinary claims. And I want to make it clear here that we're covering only some of the amazing claims he makes. There are many more. And if you listen to all his talks, it only ramps up the difficulty of believing his overall story if it's not backed up by documentation. Nevertheless, here's how he describes his family. You know, I was uh, in a family of 23. I am the 23rd in my family. My mom was a, a great mom, a saint. And my dad was great also. And uh, he died when I was 10 years old. And my mom, uh, one year before, I was ordained priest. So he says that there were 23 people in his family, which might mean two parents plus 21 children. However, according to his biography in Christine Watkins' book, The Warning, there were actually 23 children in his family, which would be even more remarkable. Either way, a family with more than 20 children is very remarkable. Also, God the Father began speaking to him when he was three years old, which he knows because his parents bought him a tricycle. And the father started to talk to me around three years old. I know that because of my bicycle. My parents buy me a bicycle with three wheels. So I know that I have three years old. <laughs> this, again, would be quite remarkable, and not just because God the father was speaking to him. If he's able to remember events when he was three, you know, and not just image impressions, but conversations, that's extraordinary because our brains are programmed to forget memories from early childhood as part of the maturation process. It's a known stage in development where our brain prunes back neurons to make room for further growth. Allegedly, as a child, Father Michel was in such frequent conversation with God the Father that he didn't realize this was an extraordinary experience, and he didn't know that other people are not constantly in verbal communication with God. Did other extraordinary things happen to Father Michel in his early life? Reportedly, his house was haunted by the devil, and just after his father died when he was 10 years old... They said to the parish priest, you must bless our home because the devil is there. When the priest came and opened their front door, before he uttered a prayer, 
Satan unleashed a terrifying roar, and the priest ran away. So they called the bishop, and as soon as he opened their front door, the devil bellowed again. The bishop yelped, I can't do it, I can't do it, and quit before trying. They had to face the reality that they needed to take action regarding the devil in their midst. He had been their unwelcome guest long enough. Powerless to cast him out, they decided to burn their home. Because Satan's activities seemed directed against little Michelle, he announced to the family, I'll be the one to light the fire. Michelle's family made six holes in the flooring of their large home, which held all 23 children and Michelle's mom. He poured gasoline into all the holes, lit a match, and threw it. A fire erupted, followed by a big wind, which blew out the flames. He lit a second match, threw it, and the same thing happened. Before his third try, he prayed to the mother of God that the house would burn. This time, the fire raged, and Michelle had to run through the flames to reach the main door, which was flanked on each side by two large windows. The two windows had blown out, and as he ran out the front door, two hands of fire reached outside through where the windows had been in order to seize him. Michelle's mother, just outside their front doors, prayed to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the hands withdrew back into their burning home. Father Michelle says of this event, This was one of the best decisions we made together as a family because we had to start life again in another village in a new home. This story contains a number of implausibilities and doesn't feel like a real event. It's too cinematic for that, like something you'd see in a movie, an artificially structured story designed to maximize rising drama with a climactic payoff. It's got a multi-part structure that's built around triples of escalating drama. In the first triple, the priest runs away in the face of the devil's terrifying roar. Secondly, the bishop runs away yelping and abandons the family to the devil's mercies, and both of these are quite implausible. And thirdly, the family must take matters into its own hands, and they have the climactic drama of burning down their house. Then it's Michel himself, not the mother or one of the grown children, who is allowed to pour gasoline into the holes and light the house on fire, a dangerous task that most parents would not allow their youngest 10-year-old child to perform. And for the second triple, Michel must make three attempts, and the third attempt is only successful because he prays before it. And after the prayer, there's a huge fire and a wind and blown out windows, and he has to run to escape through the flames and get out of the house. And two demonic hands of fire reach out to seize him, but his mother prays and they withdraw. It's too cinematic, too implausible, not like a real event. Also, if this story had a basis in fact, there should be records of it that can be produced. Local law enforcements and fire departments have paperwork on it when a house burns down. They do arson investigations to determine whether a building has been deliberately burned down. And insurance companies do their own investigations lest people commit insurance fraud by means of arson. So there should be a paper trail on this, and I'd love to see it. Another extraordinary thing, one of many, happened to Father Rodrigue while he was saying Mass on Christmas Eve in Montreal in the year 2009, when a woman died in the church and four doctors who were there were trying to revive her. And I saw this lady who was laying down, and they tried to reanimate her, you know, like that. I saw just this lady and the doctors who tried to reanimate. And after a while, they said to me, it's finished, Father, it's finished. Yes, she's dead, dead. So I said, no, it's cannot. It's going to be. And I don't know why I put my hands like that on her chest. But she was dead, no problem. <laughs> You know, she will not stand to say, oh, you touch me. <laughs> so I put my head <laughs> and I said, in the name of the Lord, come back. You know, and I heard. 
so she came back and she jumped you know in front of me and she was oh I'm so well I'm so well I was never well like that before I'm so well father father I'm so well I took her hand and I said stop stop you must go to the no 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 you must go to the hospital and when you will go to the hospital you will find nothing of you so you will come back and when you will come back the big door of the door of the church will open behind you will arrive in front of me and I will give you the holy communion she looked at me and said yes so they put her in the hospital and you know it was the last the last one who are coming for the communion on the line of communion and suddenly crack you know in the back of the church <laughs> this church have more than 100 years old and this door was not open since perhaps 70 years i don't know and the, and i saw the door behind opening like that you know with nobody who pushed on this and suddenly she just appeared <laughs> for the holy communion and i gave her the holy communion and at that time when she received the holy communion the people stand in the church and clap their hands you know so father rodrigue raised this woman back to life in the middle of the christmas eve mass some might find his joking about putting his hands on the woman's chest inappropriate. After bringing her back to life, Father Rodrigue rightly told her to go to the hospital to get checked out, which she then did. Normally, if you go into a hospital and report that you have just been clinically dead, which means you've suffered a cardiac arrest and been revived, they will run all kinds of tests on you and keep you there for observations for an extended period of time. This happens, for example, when paramedics have shocked someone's heart back into motion and they accompany the person to the hospital. That person is going to spend quite a bit of time being tested, observed, and evaluated before it will be determined it's safe to release them. In this case, we would, ha and you know, one reason for that is if they release the person too soon and they keel over, they're going to get sued. So they have a mighty financial interest not to release people against medical advice and, and keeping them there until they can be thoroughly tested. In this case, we would have expected one or more of the doctors who were trying to revive the woman in the cathedral to accompany her to the hospital to make sure she got there safely and to explain what happened to the hospital staff. According to the Countdown to the Kingdom website, someone had called an ambulance, and she was taken there in that, so the paramedics would have taken her, possibly accompanied by one of the doctors. Father Rodrigue says this occurred in the Church of St. Michael in Montreal near the St. Lawrence River, so I checked Google Maps, and the nearest hospital is 12 minutes away by car, meaning a round-trip time of 24 minutes, more or less. But despite the extensive testing and observation that they should have done at the hospital, the woman arrived back before the end of Mass. She entered through a door that had not been opened in perhaps 70 years, which apparently opened by itself, and Father Rodrigue gave her communion, and the Mass attendees, who had seen her raised back to life and taken to the hospital, applauded. Putting it politely, I would really like to see documentation of this story, including the woman's incredibly short hospital visit. I'd also like to see any contemporary mentions of this woman being publicly brought back to life in the Canadian Catholic press or in social media. I mean, since this was 2009, I know if I saw a woman raised back to life in front of me in a church, I'd definitely blog about it. And I'm sure many others in the congregation would mention it online, too. What about Father Rodrigue's own health? I understand he reports having suffered from a series of health problems. He says that he has had eight heart attacks. He says that he has been clinically dead and revived four times. The last time, he says it took the doctors four hours to revive him. While that's technically possible, because if you cool down a body enough, rapidly enough, it's possible to revive them after that long, but it's extremely rare for this to be done. That is not a normal medical procedure, and so the claim that it took four hours to revive him from clinical death is improbable. 
And he says he survived serious cases of cancer three times, including a cancer of the eyes that was miraculously healed. He also had another killer cancer, in his words, in his torso, and that was miraculously healed. He doesn't go into detail in this clip, but here he says, I said, Father, why me? You know, I have eight heart attacks. I have cancer, three cancer, and I have, you know, many things. And now I'm not so much intelligent. You have younger than me. They are bright. Why don't take them? And he said, <laughs> No, because I was reanimated four times. And uh, I have eight heart attacks. Uh, I died before, you know. That's not impossible, but it's quite unusual. And there should be medical records that would back it up. But it's not even the most dramatic of his medical stories. At several points in his talk, he discusses Psalm 91, which says in part, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. According to Father Rodrigue, Jesus has revealed to him a secret meaning for this psalm, which has to do with the time of the refuges. But it also apparently has a special application to Father Rodrigue himself, especially the parts about being delivered from the deadly pestilence and the arrow that flies by day. Concerning being delivered from the deadly pestilence, Father Rodrigue recounts an incident when he was in Banff, Alberta, in Western Canada. You know, when I was in, uh, in west of Canada, I was at the Banff, and we have a big banquet there, and I commend a salad, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I eat it. And suddenly, a pain came, oh, almost right away, in my feet. It was so strong, so strong, and coming, going, and going. I said, what is that? I think I have a heart attack. And I... I, I stand and I begin to walk to the hospital who was facing the restaurant, you know, to cross the street. And more I go, more I cannot walk. It was terrible. And then, you know, I said, I think I have a heart attack. Oh, boy. You know, when you say that in the hospital, they take you and put you in the room and, <laughs> you know, and they take some pull, make the test and everything. They said, no, 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 it's not a heart attack. He put the x you know, they have a machine for the x-ray. He put the x-ray there and he can see the result immediately. So it was a Russian doctor. He said, it's impossible. He said to the nurse, get me all the anti-poison that you have here. So he said, I don't understand. I said, what do you mean? He said, I am a Russian doctor from the army of Russia. And, you know, I am a scientific and I have created this poison. It's an arm. And I destroy all of them before to quit. And they are here. I said, it's impossible. I destroy it. But he sent me in Montreal because they have all the, the medicine that I need. So it took five days to go there, imagine. Because, you know, I have to drive a car. And then, you know, the, uh, the doctor in Mont Montreal gave me everything. And um, she, she explained to me that it was an arm, what we call... Uh, a weapon, yeah, biological weapon created by this doctor, and he, uh, she has to advise uh, the head of the, you know, the, the, the armies in Canada. So Father Rodrigue ate a salad, which led to him having pain in his feet, which he interpreted as a heart attack. And upon going to the hospital, he reported a suspected heart attack, not a cardiac arrest, but just a heart attack. And they ran all kinds of detailed tests on him, unlike the woman who got back before the end of Mass in Montreal after a full cardiac arrest. But instead of having a heart attack, it turned out that he had been infected by a Russian bioweapon, which the doctor somehow diagnosed by looking at an x-ray. And this bioweapon had been developed by the very doctor who was coincidentally treating him, only it shouldn't have been possible for him to be infected with it because the doctor destroyed all the samples of the bioweapon before coming to Canada. And then, 
instead of being medically evacuated for further treatment and evaluation, he was allowed to drive himself back to Montreal, which required a five-day trip in a car. And when he got there, the doctor confirmed that it was a Russian bioweapon and needed to be reported to the Canadian military authorities, something one would expect would also have been reported from the original hospital that discovered the bioweapon in Banff. This is clearly a remarkable series of events, and I would say that it definitely should have been reported to the Canadian military, as well as intelligence and law enforcement agencies, who should have immediately opened an investigation into the Russian doctor and what biological samples he may have brought with him into the country and how they got out into the community and ended up contaminating a restaurant across the street from the hospital. And there should be documentation of this all over the place. I mean, just imagine what would happen if a Russian bioweapon was found to be striking down restaurant patrons in your hometown. That would get noticed. But having been delivered from the deadly pestilence, Father Rodrigue was then delivered from an arrow-like object that flies by day. In the following account, he refers to the object as a crowbar, but he's searching for the right English word, and based on the diameter he describes it as having, some have suggested that what he actually meant was a piece of construction rebar rather than a crowbar. And you know, uh, the f soon after I, will, I have received that, I was going in Montreal, and then I saw this little dark point in the sky coming so fast, you know, and it seemed coming with an angle to hit me. <laughs> I said, what is that? And this thing was dark and quick, and it received a slap, you know, like somebody would slap it. And the, the, she's going down, bound, and enter in my, uh, eat my car. So I pull out. And when I arrived in front, it was in the bumper of the car. It was an uh, uh, iron crowbar. crowbar. Mechanic crowbar. Mechanic crowbar. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's true. And you know, and the, the head of this was not bigger than my little finger. And it was in my bumper, just make a little hole and vibrating like that, you know. <laughs> and I pulled that and I arrived uh, to my friend priest, who is an engineer. He, he worked for the, you know, when they, they make, uh, for the NASA, when they make uh, the, the big spaceship. So, and he knows exactly the effect of everything, you know. So I tell him the story, he said, Michel, show me that. So I show him. He was, wow. He said, you know something? If this thing has hit you, as you said, normally the front of your will be destroyed because the, the, the impact was so great. And he said, nothing is there. So I said, I was just finishing my prayer and my, and my rosary and my prayer of St. Michael. You know, <laughs> this is him who slapped you know, this thing. So Father Rodrigue's NASA engineer priest friend confirmed that if this crowbar or piece of rebar had struck, it would have been really destructive. But St. Michael slapped it so that it harmlessly embedded itself in Father Rodrigue's car bumper, and he was delivered from the arrow that flies by day. Father Michel also reports having a very unusual encounter with Pope John Paul II. According to the Countdown to the Kingdom website... Father Michel made a trip to Rome and one day there began looking for St. Peter's tomb in St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. He found himself at the foot of a staircase and decided to climb it. At the top of the staircase was an open door. He stepped through it to see Pope John Paul II sitting at his desk in an undershirt and his papal garments, clearly not expecting company. The Pope turned to face Father Michel and smiled. Can I help you? He asked in French, though he had no way of knowing what language Father Michel spoke. Oh, Holy Father, gasped Father Michel, who dropped to his knees. No, no, I'm fine. Is there anything you need? No, nothing. Feel free to stand up. Who sent you here? The Blessed Mother? Yes, she sometimes does that. Read First and Second Peter and the first letter of John. They speak of these times. 
Yes, Holy Father. And then the Pope gave Father Michel his blessing. Father Michel then asked timidly, How do I leave? The same way you came, he said with smiling eyes. If you wouldn't mind, please shut the door after you. This account is improbable because John Paul II did not have an office in St. Peter's Basilica. Further, one would not be able to gain access to the Pope by going through an open, unguarded door any more than you'd be able to gain access to a president or a prime minister by going through an unguarded door. Every Pope is guarded, and that certainly was true of John Paul II after the assassination attempt made on his life in 1981. In fact, the Vatican has two different security services, one of which is the colorful Swiss Guard, and the other of which is the more low-key Gendarmerie Corps of Vatican City State. There should have been guards there. Also, the Pope would have been accompanied by one of the several private secretaries he had, such as Monsignor Stanislaw Ziewicz. When he's not sleeping, the Pope constantly has people around him to keep unauthorized persons from approaching him, so this encounter is implausible on its face. Now, there are a lot more amazing and miraculous events that Father Rodrigue reports happening in his life, and it would be very interesting to see documentation that they actually happened, but this should give you a sample of what some of his claims are. Last episode, we noted a phenomenon in the UFO contactee movement where people who claimed they'd been given messages by the Space Brothers would repeat the substance of the messages that had been given by earlier contactees, but with specific types of variations that made them more dramatic and claimed greater authority for the later contactees. Could anything like that be happening here? Potentially. I should note that just because later contactees told more vivid stories and claimed more authority than the earlier contactees, that didn't prove they were borrowing material from each other. However, it is a pattern that is consistent with the idea that they were borrowing material from earlier contactees and then modifying it so that their own messages would stand out and get attention. In the same way, even if we see a similar pattern happening among people who claim to have messages from heaven, it doesn't prove that they are borrowing the material from each other and modifying it to get attention, but that is a possibility that needs to be considered. In the case of Father Rodrigue, we know that he is aware of other visionaries who have been making similar claims to his. Earlier in this episode, we had a quotation from him where he cited St. Faustina Kowalska. And if you listen to his talks, he cites other apparitions and seers, including unapproved ones like Garabandal and Medjugorje, as well as approved ones like La Salette, Nock, and Akita. So he's definitely aware of the apparition literature and hypothetically could be borrowing from it, either consciously or without being aware that that's what he's doing. His claims are definitely more detailed and vivid than the previous seers. For example, his discussion of airplanes stopping in mid-flight, how many weeks there will be for people to convert after the warning, what the wave of conversions will involve and what people will have to do, how the warning will be explained away by the Antichrist, how people's guardian angels will guide them to refuges with moving flames, what it will be like living in the refuges, the details of World War III, the assassination of Pope Francis and Pope Benedict, the attempt to convoke a council, all these things paint a much more vivid picture than what the earlier visionaries were reporting. Does he attempt to claim more authority for himself or to have a more special role in God's plan? He does claim to have received a very special role in God's plan. He reports that two years ago in 2018, when the bishop put the new vesture that he had designed for his order on him, he received a revelation from the Virgin Mary telling him that he was the apostle of the last time. When he gave me the vestment and he put that, you know, on me, I heard the voice of the Virgin Mary saying, I call the apostle of the last time. So Father Rodrigue, according to this revelation, is not an apostle of the last time. Mary called him as the apostle of the last time. And this was confirmed by a revelation he got from St. Michael the Archangel in January of 2019. 
It was, you know, January. The hour is coming. He doesn't say, he doesn't talk about the period. He talk about the hour. The hour is coming and the day is coming when you will see the salvation of God. Be careful today more than ever. We pray with the mother of God for the apostle of the last time to rise. It is you. St. Michael the Archangel, together with the Virgin Mary and others in heaven, are all praying for Father Rodrigue to rise as the apostle of the last time. And just to make sure he understands the point, St. Michael tells him, it is you. So while others also might have a role as apostles of the end times, based on his own words, as we've heard them in these two clips, Father Rodrigue sounds like he has a more special place in God's plan than other visionaries, as his more dramatic revelations also would indicate. One of the criteria the CDF cited as positive was, quote, habitual docility towards ecclesiastical authority, end quote. Has Father Rodrigue showed this quality? Much of the time, it would seem so. However, there appear to be lapses. He is often presented as an official exorcist of the church, something we'll have more to say about later. And it appears that he has performed exorcisms. It's been speculated that he may only have been called to assist another exorcist without being one himself. But in the following clip, he describes how he performed an exorcism on a woman with only one other person present, a laywoman who is a psychologist. You know, a day I was an exorcising person in uh, Quebec. I went there with a specialist, and the specialist was a specialist in psychology. And before we enter in this house, where was this person? And I gave her, her the truck that I will use to let the, the devil manifest. So I put the holy oil in her hands as a sign of the cross. So we enter there, and <laughs> it was a lady, you know. And she present immediately her hand to her. So she touched her hands with the holy oil. And she start to spin, you know, <laughs> and goes until the, where was the sink, you know, and wash her hand with soap, so much with all kind of ugly, ugly face, you know, and she took the towels there. And me, I was there and I said, something happened. <laughs> It was just Father Rodrigue and the psychologist present for this exorcism, so he seemed to perform it himself. In the full talk, he mentions that this happened in Montreal. And it's very important to know where an exorcism happened, because canon law requires a priest to have permission from the local ordinary. Canon 1172, Section 1 provides, No one can perform exorcisms legitimately upon the possessed, unless he has obtained special and express permission from the local ordinary. With that as background, listen to what Father Rodrigue says about an incident where he believes a demon tried to trick him into performing an exorcism outside of his jurisdiction. You know, I was not in my diocese. And you know what it's mean? It was a trick by the devil that I will begin an exorcism. Because with that, it will go to the bishop. To the bishop, to my bishop. And he had this obedience. <laughs> Always the same. Always the same appeal, you know. Yeah, because you, when you do some, uh, uh, an exorcism outside of your diocese, you have not the authority of the bishop. Point. So... So it gives them, you know, a feel, a trick power. <laughs> always the same. He says that it's always the same when you do an exorcism outside your diocese and it gets back to your bishop because bishops are on a power trip. That sounds like he may have done unauthorized exorcisms before and gotten in trouble with his bishop, though in a recent letter he appears to deny this. 
if he has done unauthorized exorcisms, it would indicate at least a lapse in habitual docility towards ecclesiastical authority. Even if he hasn't, the way he publicly mocks bishops in this clip and says they're on a power trip itself displays a lapse of habitual docility towards ecclesiastical authority. Is there anything else we should know in evaluating the CDS criterion that a visionary should display the quality of honesty? We've looked at a number of incidents that Father Rodrigue claims to have happened and that, if they happened, were quite amazing and, as told, are improbable. Like the woman who died, was brought back to life, went to the hospital, and made it back before the end of communion at Mass. Or his being infected with the Russian bioweapon. Perhaps some of those could be documented, and perhaps some of the ones that can't be documented were true. However, the number of these improbable claims without documentation does raise a question about whether he's speaking factually or not. I'm not accusing him of lying, though lying is one possibility. Another possibility is gross exaggeration, and another is having a proneness to fantasy and imagination. In any case, the factuality of quite a number of Father Rodrigue's claims would be questioned by people who are not already believers in his story. The factuality of his self-presentation also is called into question by the way he has allowed himself to be described. For example, the original edition of Christine Watkins' book, The Warning, described him this way. Father Michel Rodrigue receives the full support of his bishop, and all of his locutions and visions are submitted to his local ordinary for approval. He is an official exorcist of the church, in addition to his various duties as an esteemed seminary professor, hospital minister, parish priest, and most recently, the founder and superior general of the new religious fraternity in French-speaking Quebec. And it wasn't just in the first edition of the book. He was regularly described that way in a variety of places, including other websites that picked up the same description of him. Now, presumably, Father Rodrigue did not write this statement or others like it, but it was based on things he said. The key claims it contains are, one, that he receives the full support of his bishop, two, all of his locutions and visions are submitted to his local ordinary for approval, and three, he's an official exorcist for the church. We've already seen him saying that he performs exorcisms. He also reports that he shares his revelations with his bishop. Here, Father Rodrigue directs Christine Watkins to read a quotation of, from him in which he says this. Page. Continue, dear. Page. <laughs> you must continue. So the following are excerpts from Father's talks. Yeah. And this is in Father's words. Over the last five years, God the Father has revealed many things to me about the near future, all of which I have shared with my bishop. And Father Rodrigue did not contradict her. If you listen to the full talk at the end, he confirms the accuracy of the quotations which she has been reading. Those are things he's publicly said in the past. So he is on record saying he shares his revelations with his bishop. And what does his bishop have to say about that? Technically, Father Rodrigue has two bishops. The first is Gilles Lemay, the bishop of Amos, where Father Rodrigue lives and until recently ministered. The second is Robert Bourgon, the bishop of Hurst Moussonnet, where Father Rodrigue is incarnated. As I was doing research for this episode, both bishops issued letters addressing Father Rodrigue's situation. First, here is what the Bishop of Amos wrote in an open letter dated September 3rd, 2020. He said in part, On March 25th, 2020, while we were on a COVID-19 break, the Countdown to the Kingdom website posted eight lectures given in California by Father Michel Rodrigue in November 2019. He is presented as the Apostle of the End Times and an official exorcist of the Church. I would like to make it clear that he was never appointed official exorcist of the Diocese of Amos. So he's not an exorcist in the Diocese of Amos, though that doesn't address other dioceses. In the presentation of Father Michel Rodrigue on the aforementioned website, 
appeared this statement, quote, Father Michel Rodrigue receives the full support of his bishop and all of his locutions and visions are submitted to his local ordinary for approval, end quote. Indignant and shocked, I wrote this to Father Rodrigue on April 21st, 2020, quote, I am extremely shocked and I feel betrayed by these remarks since I never approved of them. I therefore ask you to correct this falsehood on the aforementioned site. I also want to be informed how and when this will be done. I want to make it clear that I absolutely disagree with the prophecies of you on the aforementioned site. For example, the warning, days of darkness, era of peace, punishment, World War III, nuclear war in 2020, construction of shelters, etc. This is what I intend to answer to the people who have asked me, end quote. As I requested, corrections have been made on the aforementioned site. Today, September 3rd, 2020, more than four months later, I am making this statement public because I see that anguish is rising among many people who share Father Rodrigue's messages and prophecies. My Vicar General, Father Raymond Martel, devotes a lot of time to responding to emails from the four corners of the world, as well as phone calls from worried people. To this total disavowal of Father Michel Rodrigue's messages and prophecies, I add that I withdraw my support and that of the Diocese of Amos from the Studium St. Joseph, founded in 2015 by Fathers Michel Rodrigue and Simon Dufour. This studium, of which Father Rodrigue is the rector, had as its goal to give theological training an abitibi, a region far from the major centers. So the bishop has withdrawn support from the school with which Father Rodrigue is connected and has issued a, quote, total disavowal, close quote, of his messages and prophecies. Finally, I would like to inform you that since June 30th, 2020, Father Michel Rodrigue's residence on our territory has become his only link with the Diocese of Amos. He has renounced his pastoral charge as pastor of the three parishes that I had entrusted to him. He also renounced his membership in the Presbyteral Council and the College of Consultors. He also retired as an active priest in the diocese. He remains an incarnated priest in the Diocese of Hearst, Moussonet, Ontario. At this time, postal mail is our only means of communication with him. So Father Rodrigue has resigned all his pastoral duties in the diocese and now is living there effectively as a retired priest. The bishop does not say whether Father Rodrigue did this on his own initiative or whether he was asked to by the bishop. Currently, the diocese only has communication with him by postal mail. The bishop then says, This is the light that must be shed to remove doubts and questions about the position of the bishop of the Diocese of Amos and to warn fragile Christians. Even before this letter was made public, the bishop had addressed the matter of whether Father Rodrigue submitted his private revelations to him. In an email sent April 23, 2020, the bishop wrote, I have to tell you that Father Michel never submitted to me any of his locutions and visions for discernment or approval. Accordingly, I could not have supported the content of his talks, which are not presented in my diocese nor elsewhere. I did not and I do not approve his teachings with regard to his locutions and visions. Consequently, it is untrue that he receives the full support of his bishop. Now, I want to cut Father Rodrigue some slack here, as he presumably was not the author of the full support statement. That could have been based on a misunderstanding of the fact that he was an active priest in good standing with the Diocese of Amos at the time. However, in his own words, Father Rodrigue said that he shared everything with his bishop about the locutions and visions, and his bishop says that Father Rodrigue never shared his locutions or visions, and he was unaware of what he was saying in his talks. And what did Father Rodrigue's other bishop have to say? In an open letter dated September 9th, 2020, the Bishop of Hearst Moussonet wrote, For a few months now, we've been hearing about Father Michel Rodrigue, a priest who worked in our parishes from 1989 to 1996. Father Michel Rodrigue then left the diocese and moved to Montreal to join the Sulpicians. Therefore, we had no news of him for many years. Although he is still incarnated in our diocese, he has worked in the Diocese of Amos since 2011. In addition to having been a parish priest, he also organized retreats and other activities in the Amos Diocese and elsewhere. 
He even introduces himself as the Apostle of the Last Days. His presentations may be found on various websites. Father Rodrigue even declared that his messages and prophecies were supported by Bishop LeMay, the Bishop of Amos, who strongly denied any such support. In union with Bishop LeMay, I expressed total disavowal of the messages and prophecies presented by Father Michel Rodrigue. I also refute his claim to be an official exorcist of the Church. In the original letter, the words total disavowal are in boldface for added emphasis. And the bishop also indicates that Father Rodrigue is not an exorcist in the Diocese of hearst Moussonet. Father Rodrigue currently has no pastoral charge or function in the Diocese of Amos, nor in our diocese. He still resides in the Diocese of Amos. I pray for all the faithful who may have experienced moments of anguish in the face of Father Rodrigue's words and presentations. So, for some time, Father Rodrigue allowed himself to be publicly represented as having the full support of his bishop, as sharing his revelations with his bishop, and as being an official exorcist of the church. But now, both of his bishops indicate that these things were not the case. I would note that the exorcism we heard about earlier was in the Diocese of Montreal, so he could have been an exorcist there. But even then, we heard an indication that he may have at some point been performing unauthorized exorcisms and gotten into trouble with his bishop about it. Nevertheless, the claim that he shared his messages with his bishop alone calls the accuracy of his self-representation into question. What weight do the two letters from the bishops have? Are they official condemnations of his messages? Father Rodrigue's defenders have argued that they have not been officially condemned on two grounds. First, the Bishop of Amos has not called for a formal inquiry into them. You know, he hasn't set up a panel to investigate them. And second, that the letters that have been issued do not constitute a constat de non supernaturalitate ruling. The first of these objections is not relevant. While bishops commonly establish panels to conduct a formal inquiry on their behalf, they don't have to do so. For example, the Bishop of Betania, Venezuela, who we mentioned last episode, conducted the entire investigation into those apparitions by himself, with no panel. Further, a bishop does not have to wait until the conclusion of a formal inquiry to intervene if he thinks there's a problem connected with an apparition. He can act immediately. Concerning the second objection, it's true that the documents don't contain the phrase constat de non supernaturalitate or phrases like I officially condemn, but the CDF guidelines don't say that a bishop needs to use phrases like that. Here's the entirety of what they say about bishops issuing warnings. By reason of its doctrinal and pastoral task, the competent authority can intervene motu proprio, that is, on its own initiative, and indeed must do so in grave circumstances, for example, in order to correct or prevent abuses in the exercise of cult and devotion, to condemn erroneous doctrine, to avoid the dangers of a false or unseemly mysticism, etc. This is the provision of the guidelines under which the two bishops have acted. They have intervened motu proprio on their own initiative because they feel a grave situation has arisen that needs to be addressed, as is clear from the force of the language they use. It appears that the operative clauses of this would be ones against an abuse of devotion and dangers of a false or unseemly mysticism. The instructions to consecrate homes and lands as refuges and the demand to have representations of the Holy Family that have been blessed by a priest, among other things, could be considered abuses of devotion. Father Rodrigue has apparently written special rights to have your home or apartment or land designated as a refuge by God, which can also be classified as an abuse of devotion. He apparently gave these rights to others who published them, which involves an apparent violation of canon law since bishops are required to give their approval to published prayers, and only the Holy See 
can establish sacramentals like consecrating your land in a special way. If you want to see those canons, look up canons 826, 824, and 1167. And the overall apocalyptic scenario, Father Rodrigue reports, even if not all of its individual elements, may be considered the product of a false and unseemly mysticism. And the list of reasons for bishops to intervene that is given by the CDF is not exhaustive, so the two bishops may have had other grounds motivating them as well. But the guidelines don't say that the bishop's warning has to include the words constat de non supernaturalitate or that it needs to use any particular language. And look at the force of the bishop's words and actions. The bishop of Amos says he feels shocked and betrayed. He says he, quote, absolutely disagrees with the prophecies. He says that he's making this statement public because he sees, quote, that anguish is arising among many people and that he wants to, quote, warn fragile Christians. He has withdrawn support from Father Rodrigue's school, and Father Rodrigue no longer has any pastoral role in the diocese. He says he is issuing a, quote, total disavowal of Father Michel Rodrigue's messages and prophecies, and he says he is issuing this letter because, quote, this is the light that must be shed to remove doubts and questions about the position of the bishop of the Diocese of Amos. Close quote. The bishop of Hurst Moussigny similarly says he refutes Father Rodrigue's claim to be an official exorcist of the church. He prays for all the faithful who may have experienced moments of anguish because of Father Rodrigue's words, and he says, in union with Bishop LeMay, I express total disavowal, in boldface, of the messages and prophecies. Initially, I was sympathetic to the argument that the bishop's letters did not amount to formal condemnations, but the more I thought about what the CDF guidelines actually say, the less convinced I was. The guidelines don't specify any particular language the bishop's interventions need to use, and between statements like total disavowal and remove doubts and questions about the position of the bishop of the diocese, it sounds like the bishops are trying to make their position absolutely clear. If that's not a formal condemnation, it's the next thing to it. And it may well count as a formal condemnation, as the bishops don't seem to want the faithful to be in any doubt about the matter. Is there anything else we should be aware of before we get to the bottom line? Yes. One of the things that has been pointed out is that God cares about his people, especially in cases of apparitions that have global import, like Fatima. And he thus gives time for the word to get out and for the apparitions to be properly evaluated, as well as giving public signs to confirm them. But none of these things happened in this case. Father Rodrigue's warnings have come up so rapidly that there's no time for the word to get out about them in a serious way, not even with the internet. He's promoted by a few websites, but not that many, and his videos have maybe a couple million views on YouTube. His message has gone out to maybe a million or two people who happen to speak English and maybe French, but that's only a tiny fraction of the more than a billion Catholics all over the world speaking multiple languages. Those people could be reached, but not in this amount of time. Further, because of the short time frame, the magisterium has been given no opportunity to conduct a formal inquiry and evaluate the messages. The relevant bishop, the Bishop of Amos, indicates he only learned about the content of Father Rodrigue's messages in the spring of this year because Father Rodrigue had not been sharing them with him. And there has been no major, clearly miraculous public sign to confirm these revelations. So, in light of history, is that the way God treats his people? Compare it to the apparitions of Fatima, which are approved, where decades went by before the message of the apparitions reached its culmination. That allowed time 
for the message to reach a much higher number of Catholics all over the world in multiple languages. As confirmation, there was a major, clearly miraculous public sign with the miracle of the sun that was witnessed by tens of thousands of people, including unbelievers. There were multiple predictions over the years that could either be verified or falsified along the way, and church authorities were given the time they needed to make a mature judgment. Father Rodrigue's revelations would have been even more consequential than those of Fatima, but nothing like these things has happened in this case. So Father Rodrigue's revelations don't have the kind of confirmation that the Fatima ones did, and they appear inconsistent with the way a God who cares about his people has been known to operate in the past. I mean, suppose everything Father Rodrigue says is true and is about to happen. Would God really give us this little notice and this little confirmation when it's going to affect the lives and deaths of a billion Catholics all over the world? Not to mention the other six plus billion people. Right. (laughs) So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on this case of Father Michel Rodrigue? As we said, the CDF guidelines don't apply a one strike and you're out principle. Evaluations of private revelations need to look at the overall pattern of evidence. And in this case, the overall pattern of evidence involves many problems and implausibilities. Maybe some of the following things happened or at least have reasonable explanations, but the overall pattern is devastating. There's the extreme, incredibly detailed scenario he describes, which repeats elements from other, more established seers, but with variations that make it even more dramatic. There's the fact he apparently has more authority than other seers, since he's the apostle of the last time St. Michael told him, it is you. He's given these prophecies so recently that the church has had no time to formally investigate and evaluate them, which is not what you would expect from God when alerting his people to things they need to understand about the future. And they're given through a single visionary operating just in English and maybe French with only a million or two YouTube views out of more than a billion Catholics in the world. There's the absence of a major sign like the miracle of the sun to confirm his visions. Numerous claims he makes are implausible. The claim that Pope Emeritus Benedict will call an ecumenical council when only a reigning pope can do that. The the claim that the Antichrist will manifest as a false pope, despite the Catholic understanding of this figure. The alleged demand of God that every home have a representation of the Holy Family that has been blessed by a priest. The apparent appeal in words attributed to God the Father to give Father Rodrigue money for his monastery, the seeming lapse in docility towards church authority by possibly performing unauthorized exorcisms and getting in trouble with his bishop, or at least publicly mocking bishops over this issue and saying they're on a power trip, the potentially inappropriate use of humor, including seemingly to make light of the words of God and the actions of Jesus, the repeated implausible biographical claims without documentations, including because the people he mentions are dead, the more than 20 children in his family, the fact he can remember God speaking to him at age three and didn't know it wasn't normal for people not to have regular discussions with God, the frightening way of the priest and the yelping bishop who refused to perform an exorcism on his home, his mother allowing him to dramatically burn down their home as a child, the woman who got resurrected on Christmas Eve was taken to the hospital for evaluation after a full cardiac arrest and managed to get back before the end of communion, coming through a door that opened by itself after being closed for perhaps 70 years. The eight heart attacks, the four clinical deaths, including one where he was clinically dead for four hours, the three cancers, at least two of which were miraculously cured, the Russian bioweapon, the flying steel rod, the meeting with an unguarded, unattended John Paul II, the allowing of himself to be represented as having the full approval of his bishop, and the claim that he shares all of his revelations with his bishop, the allowing of himself to be represented as an official exorcist of the church, the potential canon law violations of releasing unapproved prayers and sacramentals. Then there's the total disavowal 
of his messages by both of his bishops and the statement that this light needs to be shed to avoid any question about the position of the bishop of the Diocese of Amos. In light of all that, I have no hesitancy in saying that I don't believe for a moment that Father Rodrigue's revelations are of supernatural origin. And I'll make a prediction right now, which is that the scenario described by Father Rodrigue will not start happening this month, or later this year, or next year, or ever. The scenario is not something God has revealed, even if individual elements that he's picked up from other seers might turn out to be true someday. We've had a lot of turmoil this year with international tensions, the pandemic, and domestic turmoil. With a contentious election facing us, we may have more problems going forward. But whatever we have to deal with, it won't be Father Rodrigue's scenario. So if you see problems happening, it isn't a sign that his scenario is being fulfilled. And fortunately, we won't have to wait long to see that because there's so little time left for his scenario to start. What do you think will happen once the deadline passes? It's hard to say. The best thing would be for him to do some soul searching and retract his claims. But historically, that's not what seers who are proved wrong tend to do. They tend to either reinterpret their predictions and say they were fulfilled in some other way, or they say the predictions have been delayed or averted because of people's actions, like prayer. We'll have to see what Father Rodrigue does. In the meantime, I'd like to quote from the book of Deuteronomy. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, where God discusses how he will send the Israelites prophets. If you say in your heart, how may we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. When you see Father Rodrigue's words not come to pass, you will know that he's spoken presumptuously, and you don't need to be afraid of him. Finally, I hope that this episode has illustrated the kind of serious work that needs to be done when carrying out St. Paul's dictum from 1 Thessalonians 5. Do not despise prophesying, but test everything and hold fast what is good. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer the listener on the topic of Father Michelle? We'll have a link to Christine Watkins' book, The Warning, which covers not only him, but other people as well. We'll have a link to the website Countdown to the Kingdom, also a link to the specific page for the virtual retreat with Father Rodrigue, which also has updates and responses to the things the bishops have been saying. We'll have a link to uh, the definition of the Italian word fato, also a link to Cardinal Ratzinger's Constat de Non Supernaturalitate letter. And also there's another website, at it's at catholicbridge.com, that has an ongoing investigation into Father Michel, where they noted, like I did, here are a bunch of his claims that there should be documentation on. Please send us any documentation you can find. So it's a kind of collaborative effort. So far, nobody has sent them documentation supporting the various claims, but you can check and see what the current status of their investigation is. Very good. All right. So that's it from us on this topic then. So what are your theories about Father Michelle Rodrigue? What do you think about this case? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page, or by sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? We're going to be going back in time to a mystery in Washington, D.C. that almost took the life of a U.S. president when we talk about death at the National Hotel. Folks, please be sure to share the podcast with your friends. Write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from and help us grow this community of listeners. You've done such a great job of sharing the podcast with others, and we really do appreciate when you do that. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>